And so now we're actually into chapter 8 uh, in, in, what, in the sense of wellbore stability. Okay, so last lecture we kind of talked about wellbore stability a little bit, and I, I mentioned mud weight. I mean, this is the main mechanism for controlling uh, wellbore stability, but we didn't really define what wellbore stability means, right? So, so let's define it. Um, basically, a stable wellbore is not necessarily, I mean, there's some acceptable amount of breakout and that you can still have a stable wellbore. So just because you ex uh, determine what, uh, or you see breakouts doesn't necessarily mean that the wellbore is unstable. An unstable wellbore is one that's defined by the lack of ability to remove the solids with the mud. Okay? So if there's a small amount of breakout and it doesn't cause any issues with respect to the mud being able to remove them, then it can still remain stable. It's, an unstable wellbore is one in which the, the mud cannot remove the solids and will eventually lead to what's called wellbore collapse, where essentially the entire radius of the wellbore fails and can literally collapse in on, on the drill bit. Uh, and so that would be wellbore collapse and then sort of a, the ultimate end of, of you know, instability. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it, typically if breakouts occur in a region that's 90 degrees or less, so like one fourth of the of the wellbore. Then typically, um, if you only observe well uh, breakouts in that region, it then you'll you'll this is an empirical rule, a rule of thumb, right? I'm not going to say always, but typically, um, if you design it such that this will be the case, uh, then you'll remain the well bore remains stable, okay? Because the breakouts um, sort of they they don't typically widen. In these scenarios, they just get deeper, and they'll eventually kind of get to a, a, a picture like you see here. And, and while you have breakouts, they will be stable. Okay? It's when the initial breakouts are wider than 90 degrees, and this is this is due to this can be due to um, so this is a, like 120 degrees. Uh, this can be due to the fact that there's a wide area that exceed that exceed the uh, strength of the rock causing the initial breakout to be greater than you know greater than 90 Th this will lead to eventually wellbore collapse in most cases so um, the basically the two ways you can the two main mechanisms that you can used to control wellbore stability is the first one is mud weight, right? We already sort of talked about that. We'll talk a little bit more about it. But by increasing the mud weight, we can prevent this instability, can prevent wellbore collapse. And in fact, if we uh, introduce a term called the collapse pressure, this would be the critical value of mud weight, which would then allow the, or uh, if you go below that mud weight value, the wellbore will collapse. Okay, so this is the, the defining the collapse pressure. Okay. Um, the other way is through altering the wellbore trajectory, and you know right now we're basically just talking about horizontal wells. In the next class, we'll talk about deviated wells. We we know how to resolve stresses on the deviated wells, and and therefore because we know how to resolve the stresses, um, we can then imagine that if we drill at a slight angle, we can affect the hoop stress of the, you know, with, with respect to the principal stress directions. If we can drill at an angle, we can affect the hoop stress and add stability in this way by just slightly deviating the well trajectory. Okay. But today we're just going to talk about vertical wells, which there you really, only, the only mechanism is mud weight. The only practical me mechanism is mud weight. Okay. So if you use this sort of empirical model um, 
um, you know, where you, you're going to allow maximum of 90 degree breakouts, um, you can get, you can basically build up a geomechanical model that will tell you exactly exactly where you will exceed this 90 degree region, okay? And so in this case, uh, they built up the model and they, they said at this region between, say, 7,500 and 8,000 feet, we're going to exceed 90 degree breakouts, therefore we're going to set casing to that depth and then prevent it, okay? But um, what you can also see, so over here it might be a little hard to see, but if you had a, a full geomechanical model where you can see that um, here this is a, the unconfined compressive strength, so like CO, plotted versus the mud weight in pounds per gallon, right? At this well was uh, drilled at uh, 11 pounds per gallon, but you can see by just, so what, I'm sorry, you probably can't see, but these, these contours are basically so this is 150 degree breakouts, 140 degree breakouts, 120 degree breakouts, 100 degree breakouts, and 80 degree breakouts. So 90 is, is in between these two lines, okay? And this is sort of our empirical or our, the, we want to be below this. So basically we, we want to be anywhere in this region, right? We want to be up here, and we can't control the strength of the rock. I mean, that's what it is. What it is, right? You can't you can't really control the strength of the rock. So, you know, really the only thing you can do is increase the mud weight. And so, in this case, uh, they drilled this well at 11 parts per gallon. But if they would have just been willing uh, to go to 12, I'm sorry, pounds per gallon, if they would have just been willing to go to 12 pounds per gallon in the mud weight, then they could have avoided having to set casing at that depth and also, below that depth, they would have been, had much smaller breakouts observed. Okay. So typically what's done, or the simplest thing, is to, you know, we talked about mud window, where basically the low side is poor pressure, right? So you, have, you always want to be uh, overbalanced, right? So the, low, the, the minimum mud weight would be poor pressure. Otherwise, the well is going to flow back while you're drilling. You don't want that to happen, right? So um, the minimum would be pore pressure. The maximum would be the point at which you're going to create drilling-induced tensile fractures. And the terminology that's used here is called the frac gradient. So the, mud, the, the, the typical mud window is pore pressure on the low side, frac gradient on the high side, okay? And so... Uh, this on the far left, this was an original casing design for a well that was designed by only considering the pore pressure and the frac gradient, okay? But if you build up a full geomechanic, I couldn't, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist the temptation to, to uh, add the subtitle here. I mean, this is the reason we're studying this subject, okay? Because... Um, when they, when they, if you notice, uh, here on the left, they only considered pore pressure and frac gradient. Okay, pore pressure on the low side, frac gradient on the, on the upside. But if you build up a full geomechanical model, and whether you realize it or not, you, you sort of have all the tools to do that now, um, where we actually consider the collapse pressure. Okay, so now that we know the stress, we know how to compute the stresses in the wellbore, those with respect to the principal stresses in a failure model will give us the collapse pressure, right? Basically, the pressure in which the wellbore will collapse or exceed that kind of 90 degree um, point. Well, what you'll see with that model is that in this region between like 7,000 and 9,000 feet, there's an extremely small window. Okay, so if you consider now the collapse pressure on the low side, frac gradient on the high side, you see this very, very narrow mud window in this region. And in fact, when they drilled this well, 
uh, in this region, they had to set they had to set an additional casing at this depth and deviate the well twice uh, because of lost circulation problems, okay, or wellbore instability problems rather. And however, if they would have designed this well with a better geomechanical model, right, a full geomechanical model that considered the pore pressure, they would have observed this issue. They could have extended the depth at which they set the casing strings in the third and fourth, um, but uh, the third and fourth ca uh, casing depths. That would have gave them a wider mud window here. They likely could have made it through without having to deviate the well bore twice, and in this case, would have saved them a couple of million bucks, because there's a lot of lost time when you have to reset the well direction. Also, they set an additional. If you look, you count the number of casing strings. They set one additional casing string than what would have been required. Okay, so if you have all the tools, you can build up the full model, and it can save you a lot of money and time. And time is money. Okay. So I think that's it. <laughs>